in now. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back once again to the Small Farms Winter Webinar Series hosted by University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms team. My name is Lori George, Small Farms Local Foods Educator in South Central Illinois, and I will be your moderator for this week's webinar, Aquaculture and Aquaponics, an Overview for Urban Agriculture. We appreciate you joining us for these weekly webinars and we'll do our best to begin and end within the space of your lunch hour. This is a tight frame, so for our educators to deliver those in-depth actionable information, so please understand why we are limiting your questions to the text box at the left during the presentation. I will do my best to make sure our presenters answer them as time allows. This presentation is being recorded and we will email a link to the archive presentation as soon as possible after this concludes. There will also be a link for a very short online evaluation of this presentation included in that email. And we would very much appreciate your feedback. I will also try to start sharing a screenshot of the QR code that links to the survey at the end of each webinar. So you can use a smartphone camera to scan the QR code which will take you directly to the evaluation. We are using Zoom's meeting platform this year, so there are a few additional features I wanna point out for those unfamiliar. First, there's a poll that you should be able to click on in your webinar toolbar. There you will find a voluntary and anonymous demographic form that would be very helpful for us here in Extension. The chat section is for questions that you have for the presenter. I could ask the presenter at the end of the moderator uh, to be able to answer them later if possible. The chat box can be used for all other technical questions related to the webinar, such as sound issues or technical problems that you have problems with. But for this week's presentation is from Andrew Corsi, aquaculture specialist through the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant Program. Andrew works with the aquaculture industry in Illinois and Indiana. He provides technical assistance, outreach, and education services to producers and aquaculture associations, as well as educational outreach to schools and special interest clubs. Before coming to Southern Illinois University, before coming to the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, um, Andrew worked as research systems coordinator and facilities manager for Southern Illinois University and Carbondale Center for Fisheries, Aquaculture, and Aquatic Sciences. He holds a BA and MS degrees from SIUC focused on fish nutrition and aquaculture. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Lori. And I'm, I'm honored to be presenting this topic today. It's something I'm very interested in, and I'm happy to share it with everyone. So as Lori said, I work for an organization known as Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. We work, uh, I work out of both states. So the Sea Grant organization um, is focused on areas that have a, a coastline. Um, in Illinois and Indiana, we consider the Great Lakes as our um, as our oceans, I, I should say. So we both, uh, both states um, are incorporated into this program. Um, when we talk about aquaculture, one of the most uh, important aspects of aquaculture and aquaponics is their sustainability. So if you looked at uh, farm salmon production in comparison to cattle production, you see a seven times uh, decrease in the amount of carbon dioxide that is produced by uh, farming salmon, a four time decrease in the amount of nitrogen that's produced, and a two and a half percent decrease or two and a half times decrease in the amount of phosphorus. Now, fish are also incredibly efficient animals. Uh, when we look at feed conversion ratio, a fish takes about 1.1 to 1.5 pounds of feed to produce one pound of body mass. When we compare this to more traditional uh, agriculture species like chickens and hogs and cattle, um, this is much more efficient. So it takes about seven pounds of feed to produce one pound of body mass in a cow and about 1.7 pounds of feed to produce a one pound of body mass in a chicken. So aquaculture is incredibly efficient. <clears throat> and as an industry, it is growing very rapidly. Uh, this, uh, 
a graph here put out by the FAO in 2010. It shows uh, worldwide fish demand and the capture fish industry and aquaculture and their contribution to that. So in 2010, aquaculture was not producing um, as much uh, seafood products as our capture fisheries, but our capture fisheries were already in decline. Capture fisheries peaked in the late 90s um, and although technology has increased um, dramatically and the amount of effort put into capturing fisheries from the wild um, has increased dramatically, total production is, is declining and will continue to climb. As climate change and ocean, of, ocean of acidification take place, we expect that capture fisheries will continue to decline um, in the future. Now, a strange thing with capture fisheries is, is that as, the, um, as it becomes harder to actually fish our oceans, the value of those products actually increases. So we will continue to um, chase down every last fish in the oceans that we can because their value is constantly increasing. Um, aquaculture has expanded to fill the gap in that demand. Um, and actually in 2014, the amount of fish produced from worldwide aquaculture um, actually outproduced that from wild capture fisheries. And um, aquaculture production has actually increased much more dramatically than the scale you've seen here in that aquaculture is now producing much more um, seafood products than those from capture fisheries. When we look at the United States, um, in the United States we're producing about 626 million pounds um, of seafood products. This has a value of around one and a half billion in 2017. The main species that we're producing are generally marine species. Uh, these are oysters, clams, and mussels. They have a very high value for the amount that's produced. Um, also shrimp and salmon. Many of these fish are produced on our coast. So about 80% of the seafood products that we produce are found on the east and west coast. Um, about 22% come from our Gulf of Mexico states. Here in the Midwest, we produce about less than 5% of the total uh, aquaculture production in the United States. Overall, uh, we produce about 22.4 billion pounds of edible, edible seafood products. Um, about 50% of that are from farm fish. Um, we export around 5.6 billion. So we have a seafood deficit around 17 billion. Uh, the USA is also the number one importer of foreign seafood products, and we only rank about 17th in the world for aquaculture production. So that's something that the Sea Grant is really trying to improve. We want, we want to be producing fish that we're eating here in the United States. So what exactly is aquaculture? Aquaculture has been around in some form for at least 4,000 years, um, but it's only um, in the past 20 years, it's really started to expand um, technology is increasing rapidly. So aquaculture is really still in its inf infancy, even though it's that old. Um, it's the culture of fish and aquatic invertebrates in a controlled environment. This can be in earthen ponds, flow through systems, uh, such as uh, systems that bring in water from springs or artesian wells and dam outflows. Typically you'll see uh, dam outflows used on the west coast on large um, lakes and dams, or in some cases by state agency to produce fish for stocking in uh, public waters. That's not something we see in Illinois. We have very few springs um, and we don't have any major dams that are utilized by private industry to produce fish. Also, you'll see a lot of cages and net pens. Uh, typically these are done in large public waterways uh, such as the ocean and large lakes. That's not permitted in Illinois. Um, all of our aquaculture is done in private waters. There's also true controlled environment um, aquaculture. This would be what is known as recirculating aquaculture systems or RAS systems or aquaponics. In Illinois, we produce about 1.5 million pounds of fish. These fish are cultured specifically for live markets, uh, which is kind of uh, different than what most people view uh, uh, fish production to be. Our fish are sold completely live. We produce largemouth bass, high striped bass, and tilapia. Traditional aquaculture you see in the oceans uh, involves 
big, large cage systems. Um, these would be found in the oceans. Typically, it's a floating platform surrounded by net pens. These are uh, these net pens can be collapsed and pulled in uh, for production. They they're moved directly onto boats and processed there on the water, and then they go to market. We don't have any of these in Illinois. There's no public waterway that is permitted to have these uh, cage systems at this time. What we do have are uh, much smaller scale cage systems. So on the left side of the screen here, you'll see um, some cages that are designed to float in uh, ponds or, or lakes in private waters that we raise fish in. Um, you can see a on the right side of the screen is Tipner Fish Farm down in DeCoin, Illinois. They use these uh, 10 foot by six foot floating cages to raise hybrid striped bass. These are typically done in strip pit lakes. And th this is an industry that was really big in the 90s here in Illinois, but it has kind of gone by the wayside. Uh, there's several producers still doing this, but they're changing their production to more of a typical pond production. At the top part of the screen here, you'll see Big House Fish Farm, which is a a farm built about five years ago in Carbondale, Illinois. They use three acre ponds. They're rectangular in shape. Um, they're about six feet deep and they're designed so that they can be harvested by heavy equipment. So you'll see there's a very long levees built along the side that heavy equipment can move down large nets. They harvest fish into holding tanks where they're then sold to a live market. You see a lot of smaller scale RAS systems in Illinois as well. These are typically used to raise largemouth bass for stocking into these larger ponds. And in some cases they're used to raise uh, tilapia and rainbow trout. These are two larger scale industrial sized RAS systems found in Indiana. Uh, Indiana, we produce nearly all of our fish in RAS systems. There's very little pond production or cage production done in Indiana. So the two states are mirror opposites in their production techniques. So on the left side of the screen here, you see Falling Waters Farm in Indianapolis. They operate a decoupled aquaponics system. This is the fish side. They use large rectangular fiberglass tanks in which they uh, raise tilapia. They are about 100,000 gallons a piece. So in this picture here, there's about a million gallons of water uh, utilized in an indoor RAS system. On the right side of the screen, is Hanaloo Farms in Cutler, Indiana. They utilize an old uh, hog confinement building, um, which they've converted to RAS production and they raise barramundi or Australian sea bass is a common term that's used for them. And the tanks you see here are about 25,000 gallons a piece and they, they have about 75,000 gallons in total. So in Illinois, all of our fish for the most part are going to live markets. The vast majority of the fish we produce um, are cultured in ponds and cages. Uh, so there is some production in RAS and aquaponics, but this is still small, but it's increasing in popularity uh, every year. So our fish are sold live to wholesalers. On the lower left-hand uh, portion of the screen, you can see a semi truck with live haul tanks on the back. Our fish are moved into holding tanks where the water is cooled and oxygenated so the fish are in really, really good condition. They go on to those trucks and are shipped live to, uh, to their markets. These markets are in lar large population centers, um, ethnic uh, grocery stores, where the fish are held live in aquariums until the consumer actually comes and purchases the fish. This is a unique um, sales method. So many other states have, have a capture industry with processors that will process fish for um, these markets. We don't have that here in our, in our state. So we rely fully on live, live market sales. And as far as prices for these fish go, from 2014 to 2019, the prices have held, uh, have pr held pretty much at the exact same rate. We produce about 200,000 pounds of hybrid striped bass yearly in those five years. Um, sale price is around $4.25 a pound. They're really shooting for fish that are around 1.3 to 1.5 pounds. Largemouth bass in Illinois are by far our, our main produced fish. We produce about 1.25 million pounds yearly. These fish are sold around 1.3 to 1.5 pounds 
And the sale prices can be anywhere from $5.50 to $7 a pound. At times I've seen these prices go as high as $7.50 to $8 a pound. So this is our premier fish here in the state of Illinois and it's our highest value fish that we produce. You see much smaller um, numbers of channel catfish being produced. They have a very low value of around $1.25 a pound. Tilapia as well, um, they're around $2.35 a pound. And animals like rainbow trout, which uh, a lot of people associate as being a high dollar fish and more of a traditional aquaculture species, um, they sell live for around $3.50 to $4 a pound. And we produce very little of these. Um, 20 years ago, there were uh, rainbow trout and freshwater prawn ponds where they would raise freshwater prawn throughout the summer, uh, harvest those animals in September, and then stock out rainbow trout in the fall, grow them over the winter and harvest them in the spring. Um, this has really gone by the wayside. We're producing very, very little amounts of rainbow trout and freshwater prawn now. Um, in the past, there was some yellow perch production in Illinois, uh, but that's no longer being done. Now, there are benefits and limitations to all of the different aquaculture culture methods. Ponds, cages, and net pens, you get predation by birds and wildlife. Um, they're open to the environment, so they experience pollution, specifically uh, PCBs that are found in the soils and methylmercury that's dissolved in the water. They're also prone to catastrophes from things like floods, windstorms, um, earthquakes, that kind of thing. Um, and when you have your fish in these wild environments, you have little to no control of the water quality or the temperatures. When these fish are held in these wild environments, they're also prone to disease outbreaks. Disease is always present in systems uh, because of the way that we produce fish, they are more likely to get these diseases due to the uh, fact that everything is uh, very concentrated. Now, well, there's also limited growth during the winter and summer. Cold water fish will grow very slowly during the summer um, and grow much better over the winter time. Warm water fish will do much better in the summertime and grow slowly over the winter. Now, a black eye for the aquaculture industry is also the introduction of non-native species and invasive species. Unfortunately, the attributes that make up um, our our top aquaculture species also mean that they're also invasive species. They're very hardy animals. So when they get out into wild environments, they reproduce rapidly and can take over. There's also a wider range of species suitable for pond culture, uh, but there are regulatory, geographic, and biological limitations. In Illinois, you don't see any pond culture north of uh, basically a horizontal line from Springfield North because the, the growing period is not long enough to have those animals reach market size in one year. So most of our pond and cage production is gonna be south of Springfield. More of the intensive culture methods like RAS systems are found north of that line. RAS systems are much more expensive than ponds and cage culture. That's because we're having to circulate the water with electricity, it's much more expensive. There's also electric, uh, electrical usage for aeration, oxygenation, and to heat and chill the water. Not all species are suitable for RAS systems. Uh, things like tilapia, trout, barramundi, salmon, yellow perch, hybrid striped bass, and catfish are utilized in RAS systems. And a hybrid striped bass um, is a cross between a female white bass and a male striped bass. Um, these are fish that have been around for 30 so years. And uh, they, they're predominantly grown in cages, but they also work really well in these RAS systems. So what exactly is an RAS system? It's an enclosed system that utilizes mechanical and biological filtration to remove toxic waste products from fish and feed while utilizing limited water exchange. Fish, um, they release about 86% of their waste from their gills. Uh, because of this, we cannot trap their waste using mechanical methods. We have to utilize a biological filtration method where we actually culture bacteria to break down these waste products. Fish live in their waste. Um, so we have to make sure the water we're utilizing within these systems is, is in very good shape. These RAS systems are ideal in areas with stringent water regulations 
on water use and sewer discharge. They work great in areas with poor soil or degraded environments, uh, areas like Superfund sites, um, things of that nature, and they're great in urban areas. Uh, we can utilize old infrastructure such as warehouses, old factories, um, areas that have been uh, destroyed by industry. These RAS systems, since they're not utilizing soil or water from a wild environment, work really, really well in those areas. And they also pair extremely well with aquaponic systems because we're utilizing the excess nutrients that are produced by that biological filtration um, to grow plants. So it's very rare that your waste products from your industry can then be utilized um, for another market. So that's where RAS really shines. We choose RAS over the other culture methods because it utilizes much less water. To be uh, classified as RAS, you need around one to 10% daily exchange of the water system. In some cases, there are RAS systems that do zero water exchange. Within these systems, we also can completely control the water temperature and the water chemistry. Because of this, we can suit the needs of any fish we're growing within the system from cold water fish to warm water fish. These systems are also very biosecure because we're bringing in treated water into the systems, we're not bringing in uh, diseases. So once the water is in the system and the fish are in the system, generally you're not gonna see any kind of disease outbreaks unless you have poor water quality. As the fish are confined, confined to tanks, we can also treat that disease, uh, which can't really be done in ponds. So this is uh, something that really helps uh, fish get through those disease outbreaks. We can hold fish at harvest uh, for aerated system. We can raise up to a half pound per gallon in the culture tanks. Uh, systems that are oxygenated using pure oxygen, um, we can actually increase the oxygen content of the water where we can actually have around one pound per gallon of water in that culture tank. So we can really grow fish at very high densities within these systems. As I said earlier, they work great in urban environments uh, because they're scalable and stackable. We can really maximize uh, production per square foot within these systems. Uh, when you grow fish in a pond, it's really the acreage of the pond is all, all you can do. Um, so these RAS systems in an urban environment are very, very good for producing a large amount of fish. And because the environment is controlled, you really get rid of predation and escapement of fish from these systems. So the, this eliminates the AIS issues and predation from wild animals. Basic design of an RA system is we use gravity to our benefit. So water is pumped from the lowest point in the system, which is the sump. In this case, we have a combination sump and a bioreactor we're pumping water through mechanical filtration to pull the, the large solids that are found in these systems. The water is then conditioned to be heat, heated or chilled, depending on the species that you're raising or the time of year. We then sterilize it um, to eliminate uh, disease transferring between tanks. Uh, the water then flows into our tanks. The waste outflow from the tanks is go, goes through what's known as a drum filter. Essentially, it's a rotating drum that captures large solids and excess feed that uh, leaves the culture tanks before water is returned to the sump. What you don't see in this illustration is aeration or oxygenation. To have these systems uh, work optimally, you need to put air into the systems. Aeration is pumping atmospheric air into the tanks, and in this case, the sump. That would be to aerate the water to make sure your oxygen is at saturation when you bring in pure oxygen, you can actually increase the oxygen saturation of the water above 100%, um, which, which is very, very good for some fish species. It also helps out the bacteria within these systems. And I'll get into that in detail here now. So the byproducts from protein metabolism in fish uh, yields ammonia or ammonium. And this dissolves directly into the water. 86% of these waste products are coming directly from the fish's gills. Uh, through cation exchange and gill diffusion. This means we cannot capture the waste products from our fish. They're dissolved directly in the water. So we have to rely on this bio biological filtration method. This way, the waste products from fish can be in a couple different forms, unionized ammonia, 
or ionized ammonia. Unionized ammonia is much more toxic to both fish and plants, uh, but the, we can control this process by uh, altering the water chemistry. At lower pH, you're gonna see uh, more ionized ammonia. At higher salinities, you'll see more ionized ammonia. And at lower temperatures, uh, the same uh, holds true. Now, biological filtration is uh, very important to these systems. It's the use of nitrifying bacteria to utilize waste products from fish uh, to convert ammonium to nitrite to nitrate. So ammonia nitrogen and nitrite are both very, very toxic to fish and plants. Nitrate is not. So we're converting ammonia nitrogen by nitrous ammonia bacteria to, a, to nitrite ammonia. This needs to be in the presence of oxygen and it has to be in a specific pH range between six and a half and nine. And it works better the warmer the water is. It doesn't work well below 50 degrees. So the minimum water temperature needed for these systems is about 50 degrees. Bicarbonate and calcium are also used during this process of oxidation from uh, ammonia to nitrite and nitrate. Um, and they also produce CO2 during this process. Ammonia is converted to nitrite by a uh, bacteria known as nitrous ammonis. It's converted from nitrite to nitrate by a bacteria known as nitrospira or nitrobacter. Uh, the conversion from nitrite to nitrate also requires the same conditions as the nitrous ammonis bacteria above. Now nitrate is non-toxic to most fish species at the concentrations that are found in RAS systems. This is gonna be anywhere from around a 100 to 400 milligrams per liter. To better visualize this process here, you can see the conversion process. Ammonia in the presence of oxygen and alkalinity is converted by nitrous ammonis bacteria to nitrite. Nitrite is then converted by nitrobacter to nitrate. So what's important here is that oxygen is not only important to the fish, it is extremely important to the bacterial community that is converting our waste products. So without that in the systems, they don't work very well at all and it will it will make these systems have a large amount of ammonia and nitrite within them, which is very bad for the fish. And these chronic conditions can really cause uh, disease problems and poor production. There's several different biofilter types that are chosen for RAS systems. Um, these are trickle filters. This would basically be an enclosed vertical pipe where water is pumped in at the top. There is a lot of biomedia within that pipe that the water trickles over. This makes um, the water into very small droplets, which aerates the water and it grows bacteria very, very well. MMBR systems are one of the most uh, popular commercial scale biofilters. They're what's known as a moving bed bioreactor. I'll show some examples of this in a little bit. There are also rotating biological uh, contactors, essentially a drum filled with biomedia that rotates uh, about 50% of, um, of that wheel will be under the water. As it rotates, it exposes the bacteria and water that's kind of clinging to the biomedia to the atmospheric air. This aerates it and allows the bacteria to do its job. Expandable media filters um, are basically sand beds that as you pump water through them, it expands the sand out. This creates a lot of surface area, really good growth for bacteria, uh, but they can cause some problems. Uh, if your water flow rate changes, they can pump sand out of the systems. Uh, they take a lot of maintenance. Fluidized beds would be large beds of gravel or crushed limestone. Um, they grow a lot of bacteria, but they also uh, trap a lot of sediment. So they take a lot of maintenance as well. And this bacteria is growing everywhere within the system, anywhere that water is touching. So inside of pumps, inside of pipes, uh, within our, uh, our filtration areas, uh, the bacteria is growing basically everywhere. These are some of the biomedia that's found within these RAS systems. They're all built on the idea that you maximize surface area for bacterial growth. So essentially it's just a lot of food grade plastic designed to have an incredible amount of surface area and gaps so that they can be aerated um, to uh, grow bacteria. And what's key here is getting a biomedia type that has water flow that can travel through the biomedia in any direction. This prevents clogging and makes sure that they, they work optimally. 
These are two uh, biofilter types. On the left, you see a moving bed bioreactor from Hanaloo Farms in Cutler, Indiana. Essentially, it is a lot of biomedia in a square or circular tank. We pump uh, a lot of oxygen within these systems to, or a lot of atmosphere, atmospheric air within these systems to move the biomedia around. This contacts more ammonia. It also shears off the excess bacterial growth on top of these uh, bioballs. And that ensures that uh, they're maintaining their surface area by removing that excess bacterial growth. So the nitrogen cycle is very, very important within these systems. This is a graph of a 15,000 gallon system that was down at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. It actually had an active biofilter when we stocked it out. So if you look at, at the x-axis on day one, our nitrite, nitrite, and total ammonia are basically at zero. As those fish begin to feed, you see periodic spikes um, of the three steps in this process. So initially, you're going to see a large spike of ammonia. In this case, it goes up to a little about 1.25 milligrams per liter. That is an incredibly toxic concentration. Um, the next step is nitrite as well. This one went up to around 1.5 milligrams per liter. In a, a typical wild environment, this would kill nearly every fish in the system, but we're able to uh, keep these fish alive in these enclosed conditions by um, altering the water chemistry to be less toxic. So as these two spikes initially occur, you'll see them drop off um, throughout the rest of the production period that is correlated directly with this increase in nitrate. So without nitrate within these systems, you know you don't have an active biofilter. You need to do a really good job of monitoring your water quality to ensure that you don't have high levels of ammonia and nitrite uh, and have a lot of nitrate within these systems. That is key uh, to managing these systems. So RAS systems are essentially nitrate and phosphate concentrators. We lose water to evaporation within these systems. So our um, nutrients actually um, throughout time concentrate. So nitrate uh, content is uh, correlated directly with feeding. It concentrates over time. The higher protein percentage that you're feeding to your fish means that you're gonna have much higher nitrate concentrations. And as your feed rates increase over time, you're gonna see higher nitrate as well. Most fish feeds also contain around 0.5 to 1.5% phosphorus. This is essential to fish growth, uh, but it's not all completely utilized. Um, so it actually concentrates in the water as well. Dissolved nitrates can oftentimes go much higher than 200 milligrams per liter uh, when you're limiting your water exchange. We're also kind of trading other things over time as well. So salts, iron, calcium, and magnesium are concentrating throughout the production period. So the chemistry of your main water source is really key um, to ensuring that these systems will work well. That could be uh, chemistry of the water source can actually have ammonia within it. City water sources often have around 0.5 milligrams per liter ammonia uh, that binds with chlorine and is known as chloramines. We can get rid of the chlorine relatively easily but getting rid of that ammonia is difficult. So the more water you add, you're actually adding in ammonia at the same time. Ammonia is also found in well water as well. So aquaponics pair very, very well with these traditional RAS systems because you're utilizing those excess nutrients. This also ensures that we're limiting our sewer and our environmental discharges. Uh, this helps us maintain compliance with regulatory agencies. But the problem with aquaponics is that we need to choose plants and fish that require the same water quality. Most plants are going to require low, uh, a low pH, basically no salt, uh, high nitrate concentrations, a good amount of phosphate and potassium. Fish, on the other hand, they like a pH that's generally higher uh, from around 6.8 to 9. And we need to choose fish and plants that are combat compatible. So this limits options on both sides. Uh, high value aquaculture species may not work well with the plants you're looking to grow, grow and high value plants may not work well with the fish species that you've identified as working. To view this, um, you can see here, this is just an aquaponic uh, nitrogen cycle. Fish are producing ammonia. 
it's converted to nitrates by bacteria, and then the plants are then absorbing um, those nitrates and phosphates. Here is a uh, schematic of a really basic aquaponics system. In this example, we're just using a sediment tank uh, for our solids capture. Water is pumped through a biofilter prior to going to the grow bed. This is really important because the fish are producing ammonia. If you're not transferring your water through a biofilter, um, you're going to be pushing ammonia directly to your grow bed, which is not good for plants. Sizing of that biofilter is also key. If your biofilter is not large enough um, or not active, you're not converting ammonia to nitrate before it goes through the plants. It may take several passes through the biofilter uh, before you've done the conversion process. So the, the key to all these systems, both RAS and aquaponics, is the size and efficiency of your biofilter. Now, fish species that are utilized in aquaponics systems, you're gonna see um, tilapia, trout, in some cases, channel catfish, hybrid striped bass, uh, and in some areas, you'll see a lot of goldfish and koi production as well. Generally, these fish are being produced for food fish. Uh, goldfish and koi, on the other hand, are being sold in the pet trade. Uh, you could eat them, but uh, generally, it's gonna take a lot of work to get some meat off of those things. Now, all of these different fish, they have water quality needs that are different than, than one another. So tilapia are warm water fish. They require warm water from around 23 to 27 degrees. If you drop below about 60 degrees, generally you're gonna see a die off of your tilapia and they grow well um, above about 70 degrees. So if you had them in water that was only 65 degrees, they're not gonna grow well. They take about nine to 12 months to reach market size, but they have a low oxygen demand. Trout take about uh, 10 months to reach market size, but they require a large amount of oxygen within the system and cold water. So you need to raise plants that would work well with those trout. As far as water quality parameters for plants and fish, when we work with aquaponics, you really have to uh, find animals that'll work well with the plants. So in aquaponics, you're looking for a water temperature generally from around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. You need a pH that is around seven uh, for the Generally for the plants, you can work with something that's a little bit lower than that, 6.8 to 7, uh, but you really need to keep your pH within that range. Uh, ammonium, you need to keep at low concentrations for both the plants and the fish, uh, while nitrates can be very, very high within these systems without affecting either the plants or the fish. Dissolved oxygen is very important to both the aquaponic side and the fish side, so you really need to keep your dissolved oxygen above around 5 milligrams per liter. There's quite a few different aquaponic methods out there. Um, they're all water-based. There's deep water raft systems, ebb and flow systems, NFT systems, aeroponics, and drip irrigation. Deep water culture systems or raft systems are the most commercially adopted aquaponics technique. These are essentially food grade floating platforms uh, that they uh, drill holes in, they put in foam or net pots and this supports the plants the roots are continually submerged, and this causes uh, the, the plants need a lot of aeration within these grow beds uh, to really work well. Uh, this is because you get a lot of solids that settle out in these large rectangular um, grow areas. So you need to really put a lot of aeration in there to move those solids to your solid capture areas. And then also you need to have a lot of O2 within that environment because the roots are suspended in a low O2 environment. This is Falling Waters Farm in Indianapolis, Indiana. They do raft culture on a stacked, um, uh, stacked shelving unit, essentially. The grow beds you're looking at are about 125 feet long. They have about 90,000 gallons in each grow bed. And they produce commercial hemp that's grown aquaponically within these uh, raft systems. Here's a photo of Windy City Harvest, uh, their farm on Ogden up in Chicago. They grow lettuce using a raft culture um, that you can see here. And these are designed so that the fish at the far end um, of this grow bed have reached market size. As they pull out products, they're introducing new rafts of their new starts. So it's built on the idea that they're harvesting, harvesting plants from the far end and introducing new plants constantly. Another commercially um, available system is the ebb and flow systems. 
These are controlled by a bell siphon or timed water flow. They are media-based grow beds. Uh, basically, most of the media you'll see will be gravel or clay pellets. They also use foam, crushed limestone, and other things like that. The plant roots are exposed to water and nutrients when the, uh, when the bed fills with water, and then it drains to provide aeration to the uh, roots, so to prevent root rot. Gravel in these media-based grow beds uh, have some problems. They tend to clog. You get channelization of the water and inefficient biofiltration. They do act as a biofilter for a short time, but they quickly fill with these settleable solids, and this can cause pests. You see a lot of fungus gnats and shore flies uh, when you're using these flood and drain systems. Here's a uh, flood and drain system from Windy City Harvest. Uh, the front end of this grow bed, you see some really nice uh, basil. And at the far end, you see aloe plants that are being grown in these, in these systems. Nutrient film technique is a relatively new aquaponic technique. Uh, these are NFT systems. They utilize channel or gutter style uh, grow beds. Basically, you're putting a very thin film of water through each of these square pipes uh, that the roots then uptake nutrients from. Because there's only a small amount of water within that pipe, they're also aerated at the same time. The disadvantage of these systems is the clogging of the channels due to root growth. And because we are growing bacteria within these systems, um, the small areas tend to get blocked by bacterial growth uh, rather quickly. Here is a NFT system from the Purdue uh, Horticulture Greenhouse. Now traditional aquaponics is fish and plants in the same system. Typically, commercially, you're going to see raft or ebb and flow systems for the most part, but we're working with compromise here. We have marginal conditions for both fish and plants within these systems. And balance is very, very important to both sides. We have to rely on plants to remove nitrogen. So as we're removing both fish and plants from the system, you're losing your balance. And that balance is absolutely critical to system health on both sides. So if you don't have enough plants within the system to pull out nutrients, your fish are going to suffer. If you don't have enough fish within the system to give nutrients to your plants, plants are going to suffer. So this means they can be very difficult to maintain. And we're, we're utilizing fish and plants that work together. So the high value fish and the high value plants may not work well together. Now a decoupled system really is the best of both systems. It is a RAS system that is separate from the hydroponic system. We're utilizing the wastewater from our RAS system within that hydroponic system. This wastewater is typically coming from water exchanges or when we're uh, backwashing our filters, um, things like that. So this means that we can add micronutrients that may not be suitable in typical RAS systems, things like copper, uh, potassium, excess phosphates, and we can modify the pH to be ideal for the plant that we're growing. It mitigates some food safety issues since the plants are being raised uh, away from our fish, uh, but there's a lot of additional costs involved in this uh, for electricity and automation systems to make sure that um, this is all working very, very well. Uh, Hi G Kim here at uh, Purdue is testing one of these decoupled systems in our greenhouse and Falling Waters Farm in Indianapolis is currently using uh, a decoupled system to grow um, their plants. For a while, they were doing um, microgreens and lettuce uh, for the restaurant industry, but now they've transferred over to 100% hemp production uh, in aquaponic systems. This is uh, pictures on the left. It's a decoupled aquaponic system <coughs> utilizing an NFT-based uh, grow beds. And on the right, you see a traditional aquaponic system utilizing uh, deep water culture. So on the left-hand side here, we're doing very small water exchanges for these, uh, for these systems that go to holding tanks. The holding tank is then delivering water to uh, the NFT systems, which is recycled. So as the fish produce these nitrates, we're able to store that um, in storage tanks then to be utilized by the plants. So we can grow uh, high value items on both sides. And I, I view this 
really as the future of aquaponics. As this industry grows, um, we need to be profitable in the way that we produce the fish and the plants. So this is really the next step in the evolution of aquaponics. So the plants that you can utilize within these aquaponics uh, systems are really unlimited. There's been over 150 different vegetables, flowers, and herbs, uh, and even trees grown successfully within these systems. What I see uh, out there in the industry is generally lettuce, Swiss chard, herbs like basil, uh, lots of different microgreens. Um, also in some cases I've seen tomatoes, cabbage, uh, and peppers. Really depends on the, on the method you're using to grow your plants. There's also uh, non-traditional food items that are grown in aquaponics like marigolds, uh, different aquatic flowers like lotus, um, hemp, and aloe. And what's key here is really identifying your market and the demand prior to production. You need to, sell, you need to figure out where you're gonna sell your products before you really get started. So are you gonna be selling to grocery stores, restaurants, farmer's market, or are you gonna sell directly from your facility? It's really important to understand the regulations and permitting uh, regarding, regarding the processing of plants and fish. So as I've shown, very, very few fish are being processed in the state of Illinois. Our fish are going live to markets. So if you plan to sell fish, you really need to have a, an area to process your animals. You need to be uh, HACCP certified and take all the necessary steps before you begin to produce these plants and animals. And with that, uh, I will take any questions. My email address is listed on the left-hand side of the screen. Feel free to send me an email if you have any questions about what I've shared today. You can also call me directly on a landline. I love to talk about aquaculture and aquaponics. I'd be happy to talk it over with you. If you have time, please visit the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website. And if you're interested in eating fish that are grown here in the Midwest, you can visit eatmidwestfish.org and it will give you a map of all the available areas within our state and other uh, states to actually buy these fish. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. We do have several questions in the chat box. Uh, sure. So if you do have questions, please enter it in there and we will get to them as soon as we can. The first question I have is why, uh, is, why is the very little fish processed in Illinois? Sure, um, that's, a, that's a really big topic um, and I can't really get into it in detail, but essentially it is the price. So our fish sold live have a very, very high value. If you were to go ahead and then fillet those fish, the fillets from that fish would be very, very hard for a typical, typical consumer to afford. So for example, a largemouth bass, you get about 45 to 50% um, return once the fish is filleted. So if that fish has a value of, of a, as a live animal of around $7 a pound from your farm, once you fillet it, you then have fillets that are gonna cost around $14 a pound. So when the consumer goes to a store, they have the choice between choosing snow crab legs for $10 a pound, salmon for $10 a pound, or largemouth bass fillets that would come in around $14 a pound. So your, our culture, um, really we, we get fish out of ponds that we eat ourselves. We don't go to the restaurant to buy bass, we go to restaurants and uh, grocery stores to buy uh, more typical and traditional aquaculture species like salmon and, and ocean fish. Okay, oh, I do have a question in the chat box that I'm not sure what direction they're going, but the question is why the drop in rainbow trout? It really, uh, that's really been driven by the value of largemouth bass in the state of Illinois. So. We produce an incredible amount of fish for that food fish market, and that's because um, the live market really prefers largemouth bass over all others. Um, these ethnic supermarkets, they really, um, the consumers that shop there have a preference for largemouth bass over all the rest. So rainbow trout have the same pond growing conditions as largemouth bass do. Um, so when farmers have a choice between what they raise, they're going to choose the higher value animal. Uh, rainbow trout also, we don't have a full year growing season for them. They really only work here in Illinois over the winter time. 
So we have about a five month window when they can be raised in ponds. Okay. Next question is concerning fish fertilizer for consumers from their life cycle processes. Is it able to use it uh, or gather it that way? And does organic, organic exist? Uh, could, you, could you say that again? Uh, the question is consumer fish fertilizer from their life cycle processes. So I'm consider, I'm thinking their question is going more toward capturing for uh, fertilizer for plants outside of an aquaponic system, and does organic exist for that? Yes. Yeah, so there there is um, you can organically grow fish within these systems, but you need to use um, organically certified feeds that you're feeding to your fish. So you can grow fish um, both aquaponically and in RIS systems um, organically. Now, the waste products from a processing market could be utilized in, um, in fertilizer. So the fish that are filleted, your excess product could be composted um, and, and utilized as fertilizer. And the water from these systems works very, very well. You can take a bucket full of water out of one of these systems and, and water your plants outdoors traditionally, and they do very, very well. Um, there is currently nobody producing fertilizer directly from um, these facilities. Generally, they are most of that. If it's if it's not utilized aquaponically, is going directly to our sewer systems. Okay, is there a difference in nutritional value in the fish from RAS versus pond methods versus the wild caught? No, not there. There doesn't appear to be so. So fish are what they eat um, when it comes to a lot of things, specifically fats. So the fats that you feed a fish are what the, the body of the, the fish will have in it. So it's really driven by uh, the feed that you're utilizing more than where they are grown. Okay, the next question concerns uh, feed sources. Uh, maybe tapping local soybean byproducts as an example, maybe some other ways to use regional feedstocks for fish crop, are there any? Yes, so that is a very, very important part of the current aquaculture industry. Feeds are changing rapidly. Traditional aquaculture feeds relied on marine feed sources. Um, so you'd essentially have to harvest fish from our oceans, menhaden, anchovies, um, that kind of thing, that are then processed into fish meal. That fish meal would make up 50 to 75% of the fish feed. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to feed fish to fish to get fish back. So over time, we've been increasing the amount of alternative products that are utilized in feeds, um, such as soybean meal and, and things like that. So we're really on the forefront of trying to eliminate marine feedstuffs from these feeds and utilize uh, more uh, domestically grown sources for those feeds. Uh, okay. An Andrew, can I jump in here with that really quick? There, there's actually sure. some interest. I don't know your familiarity with this, and I want to talk to you about this offline. Uh, related to uh, rearing uh, black soldier fly larva for lots of different types of animal feed, but also in these sort of aquaponic and prawn culture systems. Do you have any familiarity with, with that? Yes, I do. So those, that method is really just being studied right now. So there's a lot of research out there and research studies being done to look at the viability of those uh, BSL uh, larva to be utilized in fish feeds. And it's, it appears that it's going to work really, really well. And that's something you're kind of encompassing everything. Um, if there was a processed market, you could utilize your, your waste products from processing to grow uh, those larvae that, that you can then utilize in your feedstuffs. Um, so that is something that is, is increasing. And I expect in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, they'll be incorporating a lot of that stuff into fish feeds. Great, thank you. The uh, farm that you uh, showed a picture on for the Ogden farm, is that system decoupled? No, that is a traditional aquaponic system. They raise tilapia and uh, lettuce for the most part. Okay. Are plant pests an issue in the greenhouses of decoupled aquaponic setups? If so, how are they eradicated and can they be grown without pesticides? You can grow without pesticides. Um, really the way that your system is designed and maintained uh, is how you keep the pests out of your greenhouse. Um, all greenhouses have, have pests. Um, so 
a lot of times you're having to go in there and treat them to get rid of it. Uh, but you really design and uh, management of the greenhouse is, is what keeps those pests out. So yes, uh, the answer would be yes, there is pests in both traditional aquaponics and in decoupled aquaponics, but your management strategies is what keeps those pests down. I have a question concerning good, ag good agricultural practices programs for aquaponics. Do you know of any currently or that you can maybe send to the uh, participants? Yeah, if you would uh, shoot me an email at my email address there, I will share with you um, all the best management practices for both aquaponics and aquaculture systems. So okay. let me just jump in there really quick too, Andy. I responded to that question and the FISMA question that would be coming up next. So part of that also might be they're asking if aquaponic operations can go through third party uh, certified gap programs of which I responded that I'm aware that the USDA good agricultural practice certification program was piloting um, certification of certain aquaponic and hydroponic facilities. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that or you're familiar with those third party certification systems and are aware if even the private companies are doing that now. Any, any comment about that? Currently, there's not a lot of people in Illinois or Indiana that are doing it, but there are third party options. Uh, the Global Aquaculture Alliance, um, United States Aquaculture Society, there are certifications that can be done for best management practice for both aquaponics and aquaculture. And while we're on the, the food safety topic, there was a, a question a little bit further down about uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, Produce Safety Rule. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that. Lori and I are, are, are the lead trainer team for that and have a lot of familiarity with it. And they're asking about aquaponic water. And what I told them, and, and, and I'm not sure if, if how, again, how familiar you are with the rule itself, that there is no prescriptive regulation within the produce safety rule that relates specifically to aquaponic water. In the, in the preamble to that rule, there are some comments about aquaculture and uh, aquaponic systems and hydroponic systems, but that I would, I would treat all water regardless. And, and one thing of interest to note is that you had on the, your circulation system where you had the UV a filtration point um, that you should still treat all water in the system like what they would classify as agricultural water potentially so they don't um, there is no prescriptive advice about aquaponic water specifically in the rule is what I wanted to highlight I don't know if you have any any additional comment to that or familiarity with the rule yeah I think you covered that great Zach okay good good and there could be more guidance coming in the future because I know the water part of the produce safety rule is still a couple years out before that would be actually regulated so that there could be additional guidance so I would add people ask people to stay tuned uh, for that so sorry to interrupt I think there's a couple more in there Lori yes excellent thank you Zach uh, Andrew do you see the market for RAS aquaponics fish expanding beyond the live ethnic market in the future and if not, what are the major barriers? Is it mostly the lack of processing capabilities? I do see that industry expanding um, in the near future. And that's simply because we don't, there's not enough space left to expand um, as far as ponds and uh, cage culture goes. Any available land that can be used to build ponds is being pushed more towards traditional agriculture because your rate of return is gonna be higher per acre uh, than a pond. So I do see the industry moving more towards RAS production simply because of that fact. Okay. And has anyone tried to raise saltwater fish or even shellfish using aquaponics and RAS aquaculture? And if so, do you have a reference for some of these examples? Yeah, so over here in the state of Indiana, we have a lot of Pacific white shrimp that's grown in um, RAS systems, uh, completely saltwater. Uh, some of them are actually even working with saltwater aquaponics where they're growing mangroves and some species of tomatoes that can be grown in saltwater. Um, we also have in areas of the Midwest where we're growing salmon in, uh, in saltwater-based systems. So RAS can work as both a freshwater or a saltwater system. The difficulty of using saltwater is your, your wastewater is then very, very difficult to get rid of. You can't dump salt water into our mm -hmm. systems. You can't spray um, salt water onto our agricultural fields. 
So there's a very, very difficult um, to, way to get rid of that water. So that is the one thing that's holding these systems back. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in Was the chat one, box. I don't know, maybe I missed it, Lori. Holly asked, is there a difference in nutritional value in the fish from RAS versus pond versus wild caught? Did, did we ask that one? I, I don't know. Yes. Okay, cool. I, that was my, my fault then. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Uh, take a second if anybody else has anything. Andrew, but, I have one question. This is uh, sure. in relation to, and I, I can't remember if you mentioned this or not, but this is a question. It doesn't necessarily come up, but something that I've heard about aquaponic systems. Is it, is it a common mistake that growers make where they, where they, where they don't think about their, you know, coupled or decoupled aquaponic system where they, where they fail to account for the importance of stocking density on the aquaculture side of their system? Where, what I mean is that maybe they're thinking more that, they're going to build a hydroponic system to grow produce, but they fail to, and they want to integrate the fish waste, but they fail to reach those stocking densities that are necessary to make the total system work. Is that, is, is that correct? Or am I, am I here? Am I misunderstanding that information that I've heard in the past? That is correct. So <clears throat> a lot of people get into this. They think they only need a few fish to really produce enough nutrients for all the plants they choose to grow. And they kind of build their system based off the value of the plants and not the value of the fish. Um, these are generally systems that would be set up with working with a low value item like tilapia, for example. If you don't have enough fish within the system, you're essentially starving those plants because your only nitrates are coming from that feed. So if you're choosing the wrong species of fish, something that doesn't eat a lot of protein, you don't have a whole lot of nutrients going into the system in the first place. So it's really critical to make sure you have enough nutrients. The plants are, they're not gonna die because you're putting too much nutrients into the system um, at the concentrations we keep fish in with these systems. So I think that generally these systems are, a lot of people, they don't put enough fish production into the system. Okay, excellent. I just wanted to confirm that. And that's, that's, that's what I've heard in the past. So thank you, appreciate that. All right. I don't see any other questions in the chat box, but I'd like to thank our presenter, Andrew uh, Corsi, for the fabulous presentation, sharing uh, his insights in aquaculture and aquaponics. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar. I hope you got some information that will help you in your small farm endeavors, and hopefully even something that you can put in place yet this winter. Please look for an email from us with a link to the archived webinar on the Lo Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel, as well as a very short evaluation of the webinar you have just watched. We do look at your feedback and use it to shape our future webinars. With that, have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thank you.